Got it. Paul Godonis. Good to see you again, mate. You too. You too. Sort you again. Ali, Ali Flag in the background as well. Yep. Got that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get straight into it. Um, over your time in the military, uh, military career, and since you've left in your civilian life, civilian career, you say, what's your most memorable leadership position and why? Yeah, I thought, thought about this a lot. Uh, there's a lot of, for different reasons, a lot of them have been very mem- memorable. Um, I think, though, probably my first proper leadership position as a troop commander um, in 206 Parachute Signal Squadron because it was that real kind of crucible, if you like. It was a point where you turn up. Now, I've been a soldier, so I knew what um, people's opinions were of officers and whatever else, and I was determined not to make some of those same mistakes as other officers that made jiffing blokes for jobs at the last minute and a lot of those types of things. And uh, it became very quick, clear to me quite quite quickly that a lot of those a lot of that stuff's inevitable. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. It's just how you actually manage it at a particular time that it happens rather than trying to stop it from happening. And then we, went, we, went, we did uh, some of those, the first tours, um, Afghanistan and Iraq, and it was like, it was just full on. I remember that, what felt like such a long period of time in in 216 um, was such a learning experience from start to finish, good and bad. And there was a lot of bad there as well, um, that it, it stuck with me for a long time. Uh, and still today, I think back to some of the leaders that I had, again, both good and bad, and some of the people that I worked with, and the style you had to adopt where you've got much more experienced people that on paper work for you, but you've got to draw on that experience from them. You've got to really suck all that information in and process it and understand when you need to kind of jump in and in a situation when you don't, you need to enable things to, to play out as they are. And that stuck with me then throughout my, my career, all the way through to being president of a business unit of 80 people with $130 million of revenue, um, always knowing that actually even as a leader, is sucking out that information out of those people that have got the experience and the the training to be able to direct you in the right direction, not trying to just do it all yourself all the time. So probably that that, that first one in two on six was the most memorable. Was um was when you in terms of your the relationship with the people you were with sorry with your peers as an when you were an officer, was the fact that you'd um had served as a, as a ranker was that a hindrance or a help in, in, in on the personal relationships with the peers? Uh, it, I think it was, it was definitely a help for sure. Um, it was definitely a help because I mean, just you know, a lot of things I knew, I knew a lot of the kind of, you know, the blags and I knew a lot of the, um, the, you know, a lot of the, the sort of standard practices and I knew when people were generally trying to pull the wool over my eyes. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, Again, that's a good, good and a bad thing. Sometimes you let those things slide by because, because actually, quite often it's, it's just, it's just funny and it's good for the team, or whatever. But you know, the times you know when you can stamp on it. But yeah, it definitely, it definitely helped me, it helped me a lot. Um, and again, that's not to say though that uh, it, it didn't, it wasn't always a positive thing. Sometimes it was a negative. Sometimes you'd come across people that you met before um, that you'd worked with as peers, and they didn't quite get that balance right. Um, and that sometimes could cause issues on a, in a workspace, obviously outside of the workspace, it was never an issue, but sometimes there's a, a way to play the game and, and not. Mm-hmm. So over, over all, over your time then as uh, an, an adulting and leading, <laughs> what, what, what did you get wrong? What sticks you in mind as, as something that you got wrong and how did yeah. you overcome it? Again, lo- loads of, op- loads of examples of that, but there was, there was one, theme that stuck with me and some of the things that I regret the most not re- not necessarily regret but some of the things that I, I, sh- I would have done differently is always about culture um, and where whether it's again people that I've worked for or people in my team or my peers that um, something hasn't sat right with me and I've thought you know what culturally this is not good for the team it's not good for the direction of the business but they're, do- they're doing a good job they're selling for example there's always a good one. A salesman is doing a uh, is doing a good job, hitting their numbers, smashing out of the park. But the way they do it isn't always very positive. Um, or a boss who is taking things in the right direction, 
and leading the business to growth, but not necessarily doing it in the right way. Again, kind of damaging the culture. I've always there's always been times where I can I can recollect thinking this is wrong and I should do something about it, and then not, and letting it kind of slide for a bit, thinking no, actually you know the business doing good for the business, let it slide for a bit, and it's always got to the point where that first instinct that it was wrong and certain has to be done has always been right and i've always had to do something down the line they've always had to leave or i've had to raise the issue or whatever else and so in it but by that by that point in some cases it's potentially impacted other people in the team it's had a longer term impact on the culture or the morale of a group and it's in and so really it it is something i've learned from that is that it doesn't matter how good someone is at their function in their particular role, whether they're an engineer, a salesperson, a marketer, a finance person, whatever else, if the way in which they do it does not support the culture of the organization, the behaviors and all of those things, it's not worth it. Yeah, that's, I that's, think that's definitely. The, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting point, certainly. The, I think part of the, probably, or maybe part of the, the reluctance to sort of deal with an issue straight away in that regard, in that situation you're talking about, it's really, it's it's very easy, easy to see and acknowledge short-term accomplishments. The salesperson hitting the numbers, sell, 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 sell. It's really difficult to then turn around and try and say to them, that's great, but it's also wrong because you're trying to explain a longer term, a longer term sort of softer thing, especially around culture and growing mm. that. It's hard, it's hard to communicate the 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 importance of the, of the need for them to change the way they're doing it, but still hit their targets, but in a different way they're not comfortable to, in order yeah. for the long-term goal and for everyone's benefit, not just there to, to, to achieve the aim. Very difficult to do. Um, and the culture, and a, a culture is probably, um, harvesting the right culture is probably the probably the mo- one of the most longer terms, most difficult things you can do or, or attempt even. But you could destroy it so quickly and so easily. It's like you build it and you build it and you build it. It takes a long time to get it in place, but bang, one decision that is counter to that from the guy from the from the from the guy or girl at the top, it's you know it's it's difficult to then um, to then get it back on track. Yeah, it's not impossible. Obviously, you can do it, but it does have, it does have an impact. Mm-hmm. If if you were gonna if you were gonna choose to be working with a, a team which which is a weak team but had a strong leader, or it was a strong team with a weak leader. Which would you which would you choose? Um, I oh, I don't know. That's a difficult question. I think the the I think I think that people can be developed, right? And so I think that if if there's a, a strong leader is obviously always good. Okay, working for someone that is a good leader. Um, is always a is always a positive thing and can definitely bring the team up but leadership isn't about the leader necessarily it's about that whole team so leadership can be from the individual contributor all the way through to um you know the single salesperson or person that does installations on a mine site or whatever it may be not necessarily the leader so i think actually working with a strong team with a with a um with a negative leader would be my preference as long as you can as long as you can influence and develop that leader if that leader themselves isn't open to to developing then i probably wouldn't have joined that team in the first place or if i inherited it i'd be looking for somewhere else to go if you know what i mean so it's a, t- it's a tough question that I, I think that i think i would always rather be part of a strong team um but as a leader i don't i, would, I wouldn't mind developing a, a weaker team potentially because i think that can be done yeah, there's a, the, the answer to this question is a mix across the board, 50-50 what people answer, but but uh, I agree with you on that point of the development of the team. It's I mean, it should be one of your, just a good, slightly, slightly off piece for the question, but it should always be one of your aspirations as a leader, I think, is to whatever you inherit as a team or a department or whatever, is to look to where you can take them. And mm. you get, you get... Well, it's, it's a quote I can't remember. I'm not even going to paraphrase it. I can't remember the quote, but it's something along the lines of a leadership quality or whatever. It should be not to be afraid of 
having people in your team that are better than that are better than you. You should aspire for that. Oh, definitely. And and you recruit people that are you, weaker. You uh, you broke you broke but, right you broke right after. You broke oh, right up. Can you hear me? Yeah, me. I lost. Yeah, I lost you at. Uh, I lost you as soon as you started talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are you saying? No, I, I think that um, I think that you see a lot of people who um, are scared of recruiting people that are potentially have more experience than them or um, are you know it, it are, are flying up that ladder faster than they are potentially. But I, I definitely think you're right. If you 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 develop you as a leader then that's going to only take you in the right direction i have been successful because of the strength of my team not because of any particular excellence in myself um and and, and that is where i think the the key for the leader is just to bring that team together and get the most out of them rather than trying to be the best person at the top at all times it's, it's unachievable i mean you know it's like you met the, the people in the in the team that we used to be i used to be a part of with you there were incredible engineers there i would never know as much about engineering incredible marketing people i'd never know as much about marketing as any of them but it was my team and and so and and in that in that aspect it it definitely developed me i learned more about engineering and marketing and sales and all of those things finance and project management and whatever else from other people in the team rather than being the best at it already that's not the job of the leader yeah yeah um what aspect of your personal life has the most negative impact on 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 what on what you do professionally or what you want to do professionally? And how do you how do you manage it? And how do you meet your family's expectations of you? Yeah, I think personally, um, and I don't know where this comes from. I don't know if it's a the fact that I've quite often started quite near the bottom. I joined, I left school without many qualifications. Um, I joined the army as a, you know, as a soldier, I, you know, commissioned later. Always, maybe I'd always had a little bit of imposter syndrome. Um, and personally, that's something that I, I've definitely struggled with. And I've done a lot of public speaking. But even now, when, I'm, when, I, when I go to do public speaking, I have, that, I have nerves. I'm nervous. And, and I have like ways of controlling it, breathing exercises or whatever else. But you go onto a stage of you know four or five hundred people and I'm like, oh my word, I am <laughs> I'm thinking that you're just gonna screw it up. And I haven't, I've never screwed it up, but it's still there in the back of your mind. And so I think personally that's one of the biggest things I struggle with. Um and and actually you know, it it can be it can be quite negative and it can put you in a bit of a, a dark space sometimes that if you let it get too much, if you question yourself too much in a lot of those situations, and that can have a negative impact at home. Um, and you know, I think that in terms of expectations from them, I'm very lucky. And, you know, my wife Emily is very supportive. My kids are great. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're good kids. But sometimes you come home and you're perhaps a little bit snappy and, or you're a bit short-tempered and you know that it's wrong but you're still thinking about things that are going on in, in work. And it's sometimes hard to be present in that particular moment. And, and that's, that's something that I definitely uh, need to be conscious of because I, I definitely can get sucked deep into the work sometimes and put that before other things, thinking that it's doing the right thing for my family when actually it's not. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest personal impact. Yeah, that's interesting, man. It's you know, it's something that I, I, I learn, I've become more aware of, or more conscious of. There is that switch, switching off from work to personal life, and the importance of it. And and it actually, it was from you, were one of the people who sort of impressed at me at, in that first year when I was with uh, in Massa, um, and the, the importance of switching off because for for that one for that reason is. The way you, you the way you're communicating with your family and your loved ones, you know, you don't want to impact that. But two, man, it reach I, it recharges your batteries to go back. And I, I I just find that if I deliberately take a step away for an hour, you know, a flipping two hours, even during the working day, right, half an hour away, come away from it and, and step back into it. So work phone goes off, you know, that's it done. Thirty minutes later, I come back. I'm going at. A, 10 times the speed and productivity it was 30 minutes before very very yeah. strange very strange but it's hard to it's hard to 
show people that. You show people the benefit in and stop stop what you're doing and come back to it. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, in, it's interesting to see where where all that new normal is like and you know the whole working from home piece at the moment. Um I, I I've been volunteering with um React, formerly Team Rubicon, um, for ten weeks now and uh working as a liaison officer. And most of that's been working from home. The odd trip to go and uh, meet up with volunteers on a task or whatever else. And uh, I've absolutely loved it. I've loved I've loved working at home. And when you start to establish that, the ways of working at home, so that you can get that quiet time or you can get space, it, I've I've been no less productive than I than I would have been in an office. In fact, in a lot of cases, probably probably I've been significantly more productive. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. I'm hoping that that new normal will help people get that balance between family and um, you know. You need to again need to manage it in the right way, but it's a uh, it'll be interesting to see how things develop post in a post COVID world. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> I've I've found with it that there's there's certain times of the day that are suited to me doing certain things. Mm. So I know if I if I wake up, I get up and I cut and I get on get on the laptop, and I've not if I know I need to sh- let's say schedule a call where it's like a brainstorming thing, I need to be creative. I won't. I won't. I will do try and do that for as late in the day as I can. I'll try and schedule mm. it as late in the day because I know in the morning my brain just isn't firing creativity, 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 <laughs> creatively. <laughs> <laughs> what time is it? Is it the morning? It's, a good it's not word. firing creativity, <laughs> creatively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in the morning, what I am good at is organisation. So yeah. you know, just 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 generally around that, you know, going through stuff, but that logical thought process, and I, I sort of. I, I knew from before, from reading things a few years ago, that the brain is more creative at night and more logical thinking in the morning, which was where the phrase mm. sleep on it comes from, basically. But it's up, only until this situation, when everyone's been forced to work from home, and I am repeatedly working from home, it's sort of it's shown itself properly to me. It's like, okay, I see. And, it's, and, um, mm. and so and because of that, I'm quite happy to defer some stuff that needs doing to, to like late in the evening, like after working hours. Yeah, because I I know I'm better at doing it then, and I'll just t- I'll take the hour it's going to take then I'll t- I'll give myself an extended lunch break or whatever, and because I know I'm going to yeah. work in the evening. Or the other one is if my, if my brain's in the mood to do something, do it there and then. If I get up yeah. at 6:30 in the morning, I'm thinking about an email. Well, I'll do it now. I'll just get on it and do it now because it's very very rare that you get your brain your brain gets into a position where it actually wants to do the work it needs to do. Yeah. <laughs> You should try. Um, uh, there's a really good app called uh, Brain and uh, okay. it, it plays um, it plays like uh, one for meditation, one for light work, for deep work and creativity and all this sort of stuff. And uh, working from home, I found that really useful, especially with the kids at home. So you plug that in with some noise cancelling uh, earphones, and it, and the way it plays the music stimulates your brain like in a stereo way left ear right ear left ear right ear left ear right ear and it, it means you can really concentrate so it does things like rain or wind or trees or music or whatever but i found that really good for that concentration so that point of um am i going to go and start searching on facebook or whatever um you know you listen to this music and it gets you focused and then you don't get pulled aside to go and do something different so i found that quite good i'm gonna go on, i'm gonna look at that straight after this <laughs> I definitely, it. definitely. Yeah, I will do. What, uh, Paul, what's the most successful, no, what's the most important quality in a successful leader? Um, yeah, another one I thought, thought a lot about. It's really being open. I think you have to be um, you know, open as an individual. And what I mean by that is you ha- it, it's, it's not just about listening. It's not just about communicating it's about being open to other ideas it's about being open to input from others um and you know i i think that there have been times that i can remember where um i've not listened to input or or, or feedback from other people and um or i thought i've listened to enough and uh, and then i've gone down a particular track and it's been wrong um and and in all of these in all of these senses i think just being open to things talking to people openly about what your thoughts are what your feelings are about a particular time um how you if you you might be tired because of something that's happened and you might not feel on your best form to make a particular decision 
don't feel forced into making it at that particular time then but be open about it be transparent about what's going on um don't hide those you know those those things i think that as a leader if you are if you're if you're open in that way and it encourages other people to be open then you'll get a better understanding of what's going on you'll get a better understanding of your team you'll be able to communicate a lot better so i think that for me that that openness is definitely uh is definitely one of the biggest things yeah i agree completely awesome mate been a, been a pleasure talking to you again paul we'll um Likewise. we need to line up another hr as well definitely definitely it, is is there anything you want to mention before we knock it off? Anything you want to plug? Uh, no, yeah, I think um, look at React. I mean, that's a React uh, disaster response. Um, it's the the new. Uh, it's the artist formerly known as Team Rubicon UK, um, and uh, yeah, doing the same thing, but uh, in a um, as our own organisation and not part of a, of a global group. And so, um, doing a lot of good things at the moment in that COVID response. Uh, I'm blown away by the commitment of uh, the volunteers that we have in, in the group and some of those people that are out there doing hard tasks, some of the hard tasks, body handling drills or whatever it may be um, in, in mortuaries through to feeding people or working with the homeless and you know, all volunteers doing doing amazing things. So uh, I'm, I'm just looking at the guest list. And so two, two, of the, two other guests on, on the Leading Minds series of, of volunteers, one is Dave Davis is in uh, this series. Yeah, um, Mike Valance, who I believe is there today. He is. Yeah, what a legend, a pair of legends. Dave um, and uh, and uh, obviously Richard Sharp came on. So yeah, yeah. there you go. There you go. Four four team Rubicon people, oh, oh React people in uh, <laughs> in the first series. Awesome. And obviously <laughs> yourself. <laughs> Five. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, mate. Yeah, yeah. Stay safe, and I will see you soon. You too, mate. Take care. Cheers, Michael J. Cheers, mate. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to... Uh, exclusive interviews which i do with each guest that last about five ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of h hour have chosen and each guest this one included gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded it's like a pre-podcast interview lasts about 10 minutes and those interviews are really insightful really enjoyable nice and short and they only release the patrons they never get released to the public i don't know why i had a little stutter there um you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.